Hi, friends. I've been asked a few times by folks privately to do something to sort of share how I work with Sibylla. <clears throat> In fact, someone asked me if my next book would be about Sibylla, and I don't think I'm quite ready for that yet, but I was flattered to hear it. Um, but I have developed a technique for reading um, that I, I find effective, and it seems to just sort of begin speaking to me right away. Um, and while it's not traditional, I don't personally believe that it goes all that far from the path. Because like anything else, we don't, or well, I should say like many um, systems, we don't have the original, or to my knowledge, there's no original document saying these are what the cards must mean. And as, you know, as we know from those of us who read tarot, the meaning is elastic in many ways. Um... And what I found uh, when I was learning Lenormand was that I was getting stuck. And, and <clears throat> I'm only now just beginning with Lenormand to feel less stuck. And actually, the reason why I think is in part because of what I'm experiencing having worked with Sibylla the way that I have. So there are a couple books you can get if you want to learn it. Um, there are really only two in English. Um, the first one I think is is the better, even though it's the slimmer of the two. Um, it's called Gypsy Oracle Cards, a handbook for interpreting the Sibylla Della Zangara by M. Jacqueline Murray. Uh, it's featuring this deck, which is the Gypsy Oracle Cards or Sibylla Della Zangara. Um, and, but you can use it with any Sibylla deck that's out there because the titles only vary slightly. Um, and so, you know, and there's also not that many decks to choose from. And I actually really would recommend using one of these two. Um, this and this are pretty much the same deck, it's just that they're published by different publishers. Um, this is by Los Carabeo as well, this is by Il Minigello, but the images are more or less the same. The images in here are different art, but um, it has English titles on it, which these two don't. Um, but again, um, I have a copy of this deck that I wrote the English titles on to learn, and it's it's amazing how quickly you sort of get what they are. Um, the other book is sort of the more well-known. It's called Italian Cardamancy, Learn the Vera Sibilla Italiana um, by Alessandra uh, Venturi. Um, this is really sort of the beginning of a class that this author teaches, so it feels sort of like you get the card meanings, but they're incomplete. Um, so if you really want a book, I would recommend the first one. Um, until maybe something more complete comes out. But I actually will, you know, <clears throat> say, as I always say when I talk about Sibylla, um, is um, I don't know that you necessarily need a book um, because once you understand what the cards mean, um, you, it's all about practice. And what the books are going to tell you is what the cards mean. But what I have found is that the cards in Sibylla pretty much are what they are. Um, it's a fairly literal system. So, you know, and what we're going to do is I'm going to sort of talk, talk about card meaning. Um, and I'm going to make, I think, a series of videos on this because it could take forever. Um, and the, the card, so the card meanings are, are always the hard part. Um, like the star part, that's the part you have to memorize. And any sort of education expert will tell you that sort of rote memorization is like the worst way to learn anything. You want to really learn things through experience. And what's nice, I think, about this particular system that to me has made it easier than Lenormand is um, it, it, it's sort of like the cards for the most part kind of are what they are. And we'll see that in a minute. And it's just like the, the reading skill isn't so much remembering what the card means, but connecting that state or thing to the question and to the reading and to the other cards around it. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk about what I mean as we go through the cards, right? But let's say we're looking at the card um, on top here, uh, um, which is the Widower, right? So, Lenora, um, sorry, Sibylla, uh, is literal in its way, um, and then, or at least the meanings are, but then you have to take the meaning and adapt, right? So um, when I say it's literal, what I don't mean is that if you are doing a reading and the widower, widower card comes up, it means that you're talking about someone who is a widower, or that you're about to become one, right? I, I, I suppose it could if you read that way, 
but what it's more what you have to sort of do to me is like look at the people places events states of being in this deck and and figure out what that state represents and this is the reason i've been holding off on making these videos because trying to describe this one little kernel which to me is like the key to unlocking reading with this deck um is you have to look at the state of being and what it literally means but not um you know i really want to say this carefully right so let me let me use the widower. Let me continue to use the widower example, right? The widower does not represent in a reading someone um, who is about to lose their wife or someone who has lost their wife, although it could. But what a, you have to look at what a widower is, and a widower is someone who is experiencing loss, right? So what I try to do with the people, places, and events and states of being in this deck is to drill down so I take the card at its face value I have the widower but then I drill down and look at what that means in a more generic sense what is a widower it's someone who has lost and so when this shows up in a reading about business for example and this card shows up I'm not distracted by the fact of widowhood I'm connected to the idea of having lost or losing. Do you see what I mean? So it's the state that's sort of underneath the state for a lot of these cards that I'm really looking at. And we're going to get into that, particularly with the people, because where this deck can be somewhat confusing is with um, kind of the places and the people, I think. Um, so, um, so that's the first thing I want to say about reading Sibylla, is that... I don't think to read Sibylla well, you need to sit down and memorize the meanings of the cards. In quotes, what I think all you need to do is to look at what the card represents and drill down to something that applies in many different situations. So if I'm looking at the widower, or if I'm looking at the maid, and I'll look at all of these as we go through, if I'm looking at the maid, um, what does the state of maidness suggest, right? What does a maid do? She cleans, she uh, is in service to, um, she might represent someone who cares for children, you know what I mean? So I drill past the dated, in many cases, cliche, the stereotype of the card, and I try to figure out what the stereotype represents. <clears throat> and I should also say as I go through these, that I am going to have to rely on stereotype to a degree, especially when it comes to certain gendered elements, um, particularly with the male and female lover cards and the male and female uh, enemy cards. So those are the two that are really sort of gendered. But remember that I'm going to be basing them on gender stereotypes, but they don't necessarily have to represent that gender. Um, I say that because it's an important political thing, I think. Um, but also because we're, you know, a lot of the cardamantic systems we're working with came from um, 18th, 19th century, 17th century. <coughs> um, and so we are using old politics, old cliches, old archetypes to talk about our lives now. And so that to me is why it's more important that we drill into what the card means in modern life and what the representation suggests um, than any kind of, like, official, old meaning of the card. Um, because how many of us have maids? You know, that was probably likely a far more com common thing to have if you were a wealthy person. And, you know, as you look at the pictures in this deck, the states of being are very wealthy. You know what I mean? There's, uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, luxury in this that, you know, isn't isn't necessarily lived the same way today. So to me, it's not about memorizing old meanings. It's about using old metaphors and positions and roles and places and concepts and drilling down into what they represent today. So that to me is how we start. And that's how I began reading. Um, I did read the books. And actually, I will say that even the little white book um, that comes with the Everyday Oracle, 
I found, you know, it comes in a couple languages, so it's not, there's not that much. You get a couple keywords, basically, for each one. But I found it a good start, especially because this deck shows up in Italian. I needed to use Google Translate um, and uh, the little white book to sort of figure out what the titles meant, because I didn't know initially. Um, and then I wrote them on one of my versions of the decks, and then I found that I didn't need that very quickly. <laughs> And I don't think there's any shame in writing the English versions. But if you don't want to do that, the Gypsy Oracle cards uh, are very, very similar. There's slight differences with the titles, but not so much I think that it's it's going to completely devastate a reading. Right. Um, so that to me is the first key, is drilling down past the cliché. Um, and then the next thing is, like any other divination, it's working within the context. All right. So that'll be sort of lesson two. Is, is actually putting cards together to create context within the, the frame of a question. Um, now, uh, I'm the first part of the video, lesson one, is really going to be about what the cards mean. I'm going to tell you how I have drilled into each of these, um, and I'm going to do that for the sake of seeing how I, so that you can see how I did it. But I really recommend that you go through this yourself, um, and even that if you have a deck with you, um, that you pause and do this first so that you're not, quote, contaminated by my meanings. But, it, you know, I think you'll, you'll, you'll be okay one way or the other. Um, the deck has not any real structure. Um, in the Italian versions, which are this one and this one, there are playing card correspondences. Um, the Everyday Oracle is a little bit more difficult because you need to know the Italian names for the suits because it's not a suit symbol, it's a letter. So it's the first letter of the suit. The Il Manigello version, which is probably twice or three times as expensive, um, has the actual playing card symbol on it. I have, because I'm not a, a reader of playing cards, that's not super helpful to me. And it, um, it may not be super helpful to you if your system doesn't match up with this one. So I think that the, the structure of the deck um, like this one has no playing card associations and there's no numbers on them. So the deck is just what it is. Um, what I have done here is I've kind of grouped the cards into categories. Um, and, uh, there are six categories that I've kind of come up with and I'm going to go through each of the six, um, sort of in order of ease, right? Because, uh, the first bunch that I'm going to show you kind of, you don't even really need to drill down too much. They sort of are what they are. Um, so the categories that I've come with first are the parts of speech, essentially. So we have people, places, and things. Um, and uh, you can see, hopefully, that the, the people stack is the biggest. Um, the other one that I've come up with... Now, the Fortuna card kind of exists outside of... You know, it could kind of fit in any of these three categories. Um, so I'm going to sort of leave it in this pile. But um, it doesn't... You know, it, it can be... It can be any one of these things. Um, in fact, maybe I'm going to put it here for now. Um, so the other categories that I have are uh, sort of feelings, um, like love, hope, longing, etc. And I'll go through all of those. Um, then there are like states of being, or or so they're kind of they could sort of fall into the feelings category, but they're a little more um, uh, adjectival. Right, they kind of describe a little bit more. Um, so these are, and they're very similar. So we'll talk about these together. Um, and then the last one is events. Um, so like consolation, sickness, etc. Um, so we've got people, places, and things. Um, I've got states of being, emotions or feelings, and then events. Um, I will go through all of these. Um, I'm going to start with these two packs because I think that they sort of are the easiest to read because they, they, they can be very literal. They sort of are what they are, right? Um, so let's start there. Now I may break this into different videos. We'll see how long this takes, but, um, and I may do like this set of three and then that set of three, but these are, these are sort of what they, what they are. You don't have to drill too, too much. Um, these are the sort of the easy ones. So the first one I'm going to go through is, is, uh, in Italian, La Superbia. In English, this is frequently translated to haughtiness. Now, depending on the, the version of the deck, it may have a different name, but it's, I, I've rarely seen this anything other than haughtiness. Now, <coughs> excuse me. 
Now, a traditionalist will tell you that the deck, that the card doesn't sort of represent that at all. I've heard people tell me, you know, that this is one of the best decks, best cards in the deck. Um, when you look at what haughtiness, I was actually going to look at this book to see if it said um, that it was really good, but I don't even, it's a haughtiness. Yeah, see, in this book, it doesn't make it very positive. Um, so what I do is I think about what haughtiness means, right? And like anything, I'm, I'm thinking about light and shadow just the same way I would with tarot, because there are times where it's going to be a good thing, there are times where it's going to be a bad thing. Um, for especially for the states of being and the feelings. So haughtiness is, is sometimes like being cock of the walk and sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's cockiness, you know, so it, it can, it can be, it's very frequently a negative, a pejorative, you know what I mean? But it can be sort of like you're feeling yourself, you're feeling good, right? So I just look at what the word is and what it suggests the experience of. Um, so that's haughtiness. Um, this is sometimes called despair. I like the Italian title more, which is Despair Due to Jealousy, which is what many decks title this as Jealousy. So again, w that's very clear. I know what jealousy means. Um, you know, it's envy. And um, with the picture, you get a very, like, sort of grim, suicidal feeling to it. But again, you know what I mean? Like, we're not living in a world necessarily where people are um, operatic in their experience of jealousy, right? Of course, but it could happen. So jealousy is jealousy. Constancy is constancy. You know, it's stability. It's stable. It's the same. And again, that can be good and it can be bad. Sameness can be very stable and it can be very safe. In a, you know, in a reading about, like, is this a good time to start a business? Stability could be a very good thing for you. Um, you know, if it's a reading about why a relationship isn't working, then constancy could suggest, like, boredom and being a stick in the mud. So again, the feelings, the states of being are very literal to me. Um, this is a deck that, uh, I'm sorry, a card that is sometimes called frivolity. Um, <coughs> in the Italian translation of this deck, it's called lightness. And I prefer that because you could get a, a sense of, of frivolity, of not taking things very seriously. But you could also get a sense of being carefree, of being um, happy and airy and light. And, and you know, in a, in a weight loss reading, this would be a really nice card, right? And then finally, we have falseness. Um, and again, you know, falseness is what it is. It's either the wrong answer or being false, being um, two-faced, for example. Um, but these are the, you know, among the easiest to to interpret because you don't have to reach too far. Um, they are what they are, and it's just figuring out later on how those states connect to the question. And these are very similar. So um, I've called these states of being, these I've called... Um, uh, uh, feelings, but they're, they're very, very similar. And again, they're fairly, um, they're fairly straightforward. They tend for the most part to mean what they are exactly. And again, it's just adapting. Fortuna, you know, it could be a state of being, it could be a feeling and it could be an event. So I keep sort of moving it from pile to pile. In a way, it's sort of a wild card, right? Because it really does depend on context, but it means fortune. So that could mean money or it could mean luck. Um, a more love is love, and that may be physical love, romantic love, or just like really wanting something. Um, this is uh, sospiri, which is longing um, or size, and I think in this deck it's called longing. I like the idea of size as a, as a, you know as a feeling of sort of wanting, but I think that that's just a really lovely sort of state of like. <sighs> You know, there's a romantic sort of loveliness to that, but it also could be, like, again, in context, it could be sort of a greediness, too, in a way. Um, Speranza is hope, and hope is hope. You know what I mean? It's what you're hoping for, or it's your sense of hope. It's, a, you know, it is what it is. Um, melancholy, again, is there's very sort of, like, subtleness. This is another reason I actually really like Sibylla, is there's just a lot of subtleness you know, there's a lot of cards with similar meanings, but there's very subtle differences. Like longing or size is not quite the same thing as melancholy. And melancholy isn't the same thing as sadness or despair, which we'll see later on. You know what I mean? So melancholy, again, is sort of, um, it's, there's a longing to it, but there's like a sad longing to it. But like it's, a, it's kind of a delicious sadness. You know, the state of melancholy is sort of wistful and uh, romantic again and... Um, 
uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, like wanting the past, um, nostalgic, you know? So there's that, there's that sort of lovely, you know, it's like when we're sad, but we're enjoying feeling that way, or we're feeling sorry ourselves and we're for ourselves and we're liking it. Um, there's like a, there's a quality of that to me in melancholy. <clears throat> now this could be an event or a feeling or a state of being. It's deliriousness. Uh, in this deck, it's called Pleasure Seekers. I included it here because um, it is one of the more broadly interpreted uh, cards. Um, but it's it's drunkenness. Uh, and again, like contextually, that could be like a fun party or it could be alcoholism, right? So we have to sort of look at the context. Um, this is this is often interpreted as sadness. I've also seen it interpreted as anxiety. Um, and again, I let the cards for the most part give me context as to whether it's anxiousness or sadness or despair. Despair is such a dramatic word, right? But there's such a broad, you know, array of like longing and melancholy and sadness. You know what I mean? We it's not just one thing. So we have some interesting degrees of feeling and. Um, in uh, Sibylla. Here we have Joy's Heart, so often called joyousness. So it sort of takes happiness to like a really full-hearted, a heartfelt, a, you know, a, a, a really nice sort of emotionally, em, you know, empowered happiness. It's not just happiness, it's joyfulness. And there's another card called Cheerfulness later on, which is sort of, to me, that, but like a little, like more, um, banal you know what I mean like joyfulness is Christmas morning for your the first time you see your kids open their gifts you know cheerfulness is like hanging out with some buddies um thought again this isn't really a feeling it's more a state of being but it is what it is it's thought it's what are you thinking about it's being thoughtful etc fidelity or faithfulness um Again, this is a card that could be an event or a state of being or a person even because it couldn't represent a friend. But there is a friend card in this deck, so um, it's faithfulness, it's fidelity, it's commitment to you know, it's it's exactly what it is. Uh, this is cheerfulness, and again, it's sort of just a more like hangy outy fun rather than like the boundless heart expanding joy of the joyfulness card and to me it's like this is where the delirious starts and if things get too far the deliriousness card go you know what i mean like they are um i don't look at the images too much in this deck but you know um let me zoom in for a momento um it's like you get these guys having a little tipple and then things get out of hand. So, um, it's just, you know, it's a little amusing thing to me. Uh, let's see. All right. Uh, so that's cheerfulness, falseness. Oh, we already talked about that. So that's the end of that pile. All right. So those are the cards that represent sort of state of being or feeling. And, um, again, they very much are what they are. And that makes it easy to use them. Um, and that's one reason why I think Sibylla may be um, I'm going to say something controversial, maybe a little easier to start with than Lenormand. And I'll tell you that not everything applies to everybody, right? So for someone like me, I struggled with Lenormand for years. I wanted to read it. Only now, after looking at different cardomantic decks, am I starting to get it. And I may do a video on that too, but I'm not feeling quite ready yet. All right, so that's that. Now the next set are, um, events. <clears throat> Now, the interesting thing, too, I'll get, well, let me just say it so I don't forget. Um, sometimes a thing is what it is, and sometimes it represents something else. So this is particularly true of the next set of cards we're going to look at. Um, the feelings and the states of being, I, I can't think of examples where they sort of have to stretch too far. The events and the the places less the things, definitely the people, sometimes are what they are, and sometimes they represent the feeling of something, and sometimes they are a placeholder for something um, less literal. So, we'll, we'll, you know, for example, we have um, consola cons consoling surprise. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of a weird concept, right, that there's something that arrives suddenly that makes you feel better. Um, it's not literally sort of finding money, 
And again, there's like a subtlety to this deck where like you might compare this to the Sudden Wealth card in Kipper um, or the uh, Unexpected Income from Kipper. This is like the idea of a surprise or a consoling surprise is more general than that. So it's not just about money to me. You know what I mean? It could be like, uh, you know, and again, depending on what stops by, you know, uh, what stops by, what's near it, you know, you get the Delirious card. Some fun, like wacky friends show up uh, and they they make you feel better about something. You know what I mean? But it is what it is for the most part. Um, sickness. Uh, I often frequently interpret, not as like illness, because I don't read for health, um, but it's it's a state of not being well. So you might think about this as the tree in Lenormand, sort of maybe with the mice next to it. You know what I mean? It's a state of being unwell. Um, conversation. You know, again, conversation's conversation. In, com in combination with other cards, you might figure out what you're talking about, who you're talking about it with, etc. Um, this is, uh, this is misfortune. And again, you know, it's just sort of the opposite of luck to me. It's not, you know, necessarily a fire. Um, uh, you know, I, I, f I feel like accidents are really hard to predict because they don't, like, there's nothing that causes them long term for the most part, you know. Um, but like, if, I had this card with this card, you know, the delirious with the accent, I would say, you know, you best not be driving tonight. You know what I mean? Um, the more the death card or the coffin card is essentially what it means in every other deck. It means a stop, a pause, an end. Um, journey, again, is a journey. Great um, consolation, um, again, is a state of being consoled. Um, again, by money in this case, it's very similar to the, um, consoling surprise, uh, and it looks like the same dude, actually. Um, so again, there's a lot of subtlety here, but I think about, like, what a great consolation is. Um, it actually makes me think of, a, uh, like a consolation prize. So, you know what I mean? Like, you didn't get the thing you wanted, but there's something that happens as a result of that that's actually as good or better, you know, because it's a great consolation. Um, so like a consolation prize. A reunion is a reunion. Again, you know what I mean? Like you can see how, for the most part, things are what they are. And then finally, wedding uh, or nuptials is, again, it could be a wedding, certainly in a romance reading. But I, I tend to look at this as like the ring card in Lenormand. So it's it's a commitment, a connection, a, un, a unification, right? Um, so those are the events.